is Dame Ellen MacArthur. You're listening to Sailing Uncovered. Yes, you are. And we'll hear from Ellen about her brand new exciting project in a moment. Thanks for downloading, folks. I'm Alec Wilkinson, and this is episode 10 of Sailing Uncovered. And we're coming to you from a truly awesome place in central London. I'm standing in the map room of the Royal Geographical Society in Kensington, a place oozing with history and has an enormous echo. Uh, But you know what? When this building was put up, they didn't know anything about radio or recording podcasts. So it's understandable. And it's an amazing place. Look, Charles Darwin sat in an armchair, probably in this room, pondering the origins of man. Captain Scott, Ernest Shackleton, Livingston and Stanley have all been through here. Many of them may have even planned their expeditions in this very room, which is full of drawers and ancient cabinets full of ancient maps. It is a truly amazing place. So why are we here? Well, as well as Ellen MacArthur, our big interview uh, is with the star of the historical reality show Mutiny, Conrad Humphreys, who you may also know is a pretty good round-the-world sailor as well. And he's here to give a talk tonight, so we've come along to listen to that and then to catch up with him afterwards. First, though, some big news and a big thank you as well, uh, because we've hit our 2,000th download, which given we're less than a year old, is pretty impressive. Well, we think so anyway. So a massive thank you to you all, not just for listening, but also for spreading the word. And yes, obviously, if we were a football show, we'd probably have 200,000 downloads by now. But you know what? Sailing's our game. It's what we love to talk about. It's what we love hearing about. Uh, So we're just really glad that you like it too. So thanks Uh, for downloading and tuning in. And by the way, if you've got suggestions, ideas, opinions, what sailors, uh, boaties without opinions? I don't think so. Um, So if you've got any on items for the show, anything you want to hear or people you'd like to to hear interviews with, then drop us a line. We're on Facebook as Sailing Uncovered. You can find us on Twitter as well. Um, Our name on Twitter is at Sailing Show. We're especially keen to hear about any great sailing adventures going on in North America, the US, Canada. You have the most amazing um, uh, seascapes there, the most amazing coastlines. And I'm sure you're getting up to what what the English would call eccentric adventures, uh, which to the rest of the world are kind of just plain stupid. Um, But that's the sort of stuff we want to hear about. So um, let us know. Get in touch. Um, and also, if you know, if you're in New Zealand or down in Australia, and, and by the way, if you are, you'll be particularly interested in our interview with Conrad Humphreys because it's all about mutiny on the bounty and how Captain Bly managed to get his men once they'd been set adrift from the bounty. How he managed to get them across uh, what something like four thousand miles of ocean, including through the Great Barrier Reef, uh, to uh, eventually. Um, survive. So uh, we'll hear all about that in a moment, but let's get our first guest on first because, well, she hardly needs an introduction. Dame Ellen MacArthur famously finished second in the Vendée Globe in 2001 as the youngest person to complete the race, before then going on to break numerous speed records. But she gave all that up a few years ago to focus on, amongst other things, Um, her Ellen MacArthur Cancer Trust and they're launching a great new project this month and Ellen has been telling me all about it. So 2017 is a big year for the Ellen MacArthur Cancer Trust. We have a project to take 100 young people round Britain called Round Britain Project 2017 and the idea is to work with young people who we've worked with at the Cancer Trust over the last 14 years all in recovery from cancer and leukaemia and to make them part of this journey which really takes the Cancer Trust to the next level. And, And some of the details then? So the Round Britain 2017 will be leaving Largs on the 20th of May. We'll be returning to Largs on the 23rd of September. We're going in a clockwise direction around the UK, taking 100 young people, all in recovery from cancer and leukaemia on the boat, all who've sailed with the Cancer Trust before, some of whom have sailed with us for many years, some of whom are now qualified as yacht masters, um, some of whom are nine years old and have sailed with us just once, uh, all to be part of this fantastic adventure. It's a relay, effectively, so five young people on every leg. There'll be about 60 legs around the UK, and we're hugely excited about helping to raise the profile of the Trust. And finally, the, the difference it makes to these young people is extraordinary, getting them out on the boat, getting them to experience the wind in their hair. 
We don't really understand what it is about the Cancer Trust trips that really works, but something happens on the boat, there's some magic that happens. You know, on those first trips, those young people come on, they can often be incredibly quiet, um, they don't communicate much, uh, they've had their future taken away from them and affected with cancer, they're not able to look forward and plan their lives at all. And then we see such incredible change during those four-day trips, where the young person comes on the boat, quiet, and four days later, you can't shut them up. They're so, so happy, they're just full of you know energy and life. Uh, in fact, the whole four days really is like that. Very quickly, something very, very, very special happens, and it's a marvellous thing to be involved with. And more information on, on the Round Britain trip, where, where can that be? So you can follow the Round Britain trip on the Ellen MacArthur Cancer Trust website, uh, emcancertrust.org. Uh, you can follow where we are, you can send us messages, you can support us, and if any of you out there would like to become really a, a, a local hero and help us in the ports where we're visiting, we'd be really, really grateful. So go on the internet, uh, go on our website, get in touch and let us know if you're willing to help. We'd be really, really grateful. And uh, j- just a thought on the America's Cup, which is about to get underway. Um, has the Dame spoken to the Sir um, about how he's going to do? I've not spoken to Ben for a while, but whenever we do, obviously, I wish him the best of luck. I think he's put together an amazing campaign. He's a great guy. We've known each other since we were teenagers. The Young Sailor of the Year Award in January 1995 here in London. Wow. Um, that's where we first met, and uh, he's a great guy, and I wish him all the best. So here we are at the Royal Geographical Society in London, the home of explorers and adventurers for almost 190 years. And I've uh, moved actually out of the building <laughs> because it is so old and echoey with its wooden floors and wooden panelling um, that it would have sounded like we were doing this interview in a toilet. So we're actually sitting in our next guest's car to do this outside the building. Um, he's round the world sailor, former uh, Vendée Globe competitor and star of Mutiny, the historic reality show that's uh, uh, been on British Network Channel 4. Uh, Conrad Humphreys, thanks for inviting us. Thanks, good to see you, Alex. So, um, for those who haven't, and obviously we've got viewers, um, listeners all around the world who who may not have seen the show yet, um, just give us an overview of, of what it was all about. Captain William Bly was uh, was cast adrift uh, it, it, near Tonga, uh, along with nineteen loyalists, and he safely navigated this twenty three foot boat four thousand miles right away across um, past Australia, across the Coral Sea to Australia, up over the top of Australia to Timor. And uh, and all of his men, bar one, who were stoned to death in Tafur, survived. Um, and you guys recreated the journey in a, a wooden boat, a, a recreation of, of the boat that Bly did the journey in, uh, but there were nine of you. That's right. So we were... Um, we were cast adrift with the same rations, uh, the same equipment that Bly had, the same boat, uh, but rather than being 19, we were nine, uh, and that was because there were nine sort of characters in his crew. He had a carpenter, he had a botanist, he had a, a, a sailing master, he had a you know a, um, a surgeon, and the cast were very much were, were chosen for those roles. And my job was as sailing master on board the boat, uh, someone who was technically and I guess legally responsible, uh, but on board as a, a safe pair of hands to do the navigation and to ensure that we arrived in one piece. Yeah, because you weren't all sailors. Um, and like, reality TV now has got a reputation for taking sort of extreme characters and sticking them in extreme situations and just letting the, the pot boil over. This, this show is, is different, really, because um, everyone there seemed relatively normal. And in a way, that was the USP, the unique selling point of, of, of the show. It was enjoyable and you could associate with some of those characters, if not all of them. Uh, absolutely. You know, it, 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 was, it was a very, very difficult challenge to undertake. And I think it was cast brilliantly. Uh, they got the right balance and right mix of personality and people um, it made it challenging having so little experience in terms of the sailing but that was actually part of this story so how would people re- react and respond in, in those difficult environments uh, and and I think the people ultimately who watch this show will relate to the to the individuals on board um, much better than they would perhaps if it had been nine you know, talented sailors or nine professional sailors um, who wouldn't have perhaps, you know, come across in, in the same way, wouldn't have shown the fear, the emotion, the, you know, the, 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 the real difficulty of, of it. Now, now, what about the relationship with, with 
the leader because you were undoubtedly the skipper of the boat but for television purposes uh, there was a, a former uh, special forces soldier who has um, presented lots of sort of adventure te tv for channel four and he was put in charge and ant middleton he was put in charge as leader of the gang but basically without you they weren't going to get anywhere <laughs> Well, I think uh, I think that's probably fair to say in that um, you know Ant is not a sailor. Uh, you know, there's no, no question that he's you know he's a great leader. Uh, and so, so, so I'm just curious, how how did that work? Because as a skipper, you'd be used to running your boat. It it was it was strange, uh, but but it was something that I knew right from the offset uh, when this whole pro project was put together that they wanted a character. Um, Channel Four had invested in the in the program. They wanted Ant to 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 lead the team and to, with his his special forces background, be be that sort of front man. And uh, I I never, you know, I never I never challenged that notion because you know I knew what the role I was I was doing and that was to be effectively a safe pair of hands, but also to be someone who could navigate and could do the job. But of course, as the story unfolds in reality, because you know we are. We are creating a program that is based on what we're doing. Uh, you know, difficulties arise because of decision making and so on. You think, well, hang on a minute. You know, actually, this is quite dangerous. You know, and and what happens if you know if, if we have an accident or we end up on a reef and that's and it's because of a decision I've not been able to, to make? Uh, what if we run out of water? Uh, and there's so many things that when you think about it. It was a very, very difficult challenge to undertake because of that, not actually being ultimately in control, even though legally you're in control. There was only one time in the whole project when we fundamentally disagreed, uh, and it was a matter of, of safety. It was water, uh, and that was a real difficulty. Okay, so this support boat is a bit of an elephant in the room whenever we discuss the authenticity or, or, or people have, I know, taken the production to task, on, certainly on social media about the production boat. So um, just, just clear up, you know, what role they had, how close they were to you um, and, and how much help they were, which, of course, Blythe wouldn't have had. Yes, we had to have a, a boat that in the event of a, a serious incident, Someone needed medivacking off the boat, or needed uh, you know, that we that that was their core role. Um, we also had onboard camera, embedded camera guys, and rather than changing, you know, batteries and carrying lots and lots of you know or electrical kits that Bly obviously wouldn't have had to recharge his batteries, so the principal uh, job of the support boat was, was to resupply batteries. Um, or indeed, in fact, we didn't even change batteries, we changed the entire cameras, so we swapped cameras out each day. There was actually two uh, two boats. One was a forward planning boat that dealt with things like issues around customs, which Bly wouldn't have had to have de dealt with. They needed to be our safe haven, so the boat was coded to be no more than three miles away from a safe haven. So that support boat had to be within three miles for us to of, of legally been able to do this this you know this trip the challenge was exactly what would they do for example if we were upside down on a reef there's very little that a support boat would be able to do when i, I wrote the safety protocols for for the whole trip the one um elephant if you like was well how would we get onto the safety boat if we needed to get onto them because if, if you ever try to do a boat to boat transfer in dangerous conditions it's more dangerous than actually staying on the boat you're on in the first place and given that she was buoyant she was wooden she was a lifeboat uh, she was far safer than um, than trying to do a transfer tell, tell us about the food and the rations so Bly was cast adrift with 28 gallons of water 150 pounds of salted pork he was given some ship's biscuits uh, he had some wine, four bottles of wine. He had uh, about five litres or half a cask of, of rum. And uh, and we were given exactly the same rations, detailed in his logs. Uh, and then on the first island he stopped at, he would have replenished water. Uh, he got some coconuts, he got some breadfruit and some other supplies to, to take him 
across the next part of his journey. What he didn't know was that he wasn't going to stop again until he got to Australia, which would have taken him probably in the region of about 30 days. So he was 30 days without any resupply. We did exactly the same, but we stopped in Fiji where we got more water and some uh, and, and a few other bits and pieces. And then, of course, we stopped again in Vanuatu. So we had more opportunity to, to stop and to replenish. Um, but, but you got physically thinner as as the as the series goes on you can you can see that we we did i mean by the end of the series you know we are we've lost some 25% of our body weights you know so guys who are starting off at you know 90 kilos were ending up you know at 70 kilos 65 70 kilos i lost uh, i lost 20 kilos in this you know and i was 86 when i started and i've ended up 67 or something at the end so you know we incredible amount of wasting because of the sheer, I mean, we were on 400 calories per person per day, um, plus whatever we could supplement. Um, Instead of what, about two and a half thousand yeah, calories a I day, mean, isn't for it? For this, this type of trip, you would you would be planning on, on certainly two, two and a half thousand and, and two litres of water per person. And we went, we started with two litres of water, very quickly went down to a litre. And by the end, we were only on half a litre of water a day. I started off by saying there weren't any particularly extreme characters, um, but there was one chap called Chris, um, who was from Liverpool, uh, ex-convict, who turned his life around, uh, learnt to sail, and I think had, had sailed around Britain on his own. But boy, did he have trouble with authority. He, he did. I mean, Chris is someone who actually, you know, a bright lad. He was very passionate about the Bly story and in fact it was his conviction and his knowledge about the Bly story which really kind of got him the role. He also wanted to use this opportunity to 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 become well known. You know, he, he has aspirations to do the Golden Globe round the world race. You know, he wanted to follow in in Robin Knox Johnson's footsteps. This was to be his, you know, his his opportunity to find that, you know, that sponsor. He also was someone that you know wanted to command respect but but hadn't earned earned it and he became quite jealous of of one of the sailors on the boat freddie now freddie was someone who was was a good sailor he was the young guy he was the young guy and and every and he had a great attitude you know everything he did he did kind of well and chris got very um got very jealous of of the attention and i think the the skill that that freddie had and thought he should be you know in in that position in the in the end i mean he he was great from a tv producer's point of view and from the viewer's point of view because you're wondering one week to the next you know is he still going to stay on board are they going to murder him and chuck him chuck his body overboard um and in the end he did go he 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 did go I and mean, he um, he was, uh, and for those that haven't seen the show, you know, he was someone who, who just, yeah, we've all we've all sailed with crews of people who sometimes there's just one person that is just not the team player, doesn't you know fit into to everybody else's you know way of doing things, and and this was Chris, you know, he. Now, have you have you seen him since? Uh, how's he getting on? He's he's doing okay. I mean, he he definitely took uh, a grilling after the show, um, the social media and the trolling and you know all the things that happened subsequently. You know, made his life hell. But you know, here's the you know here's the ironic thing. Really, he can turn this story into a positive story by by really going out and and showing that you know that he's learned some things and and he will do that. Uh, you know, no doubt. I mean, there's a couple of. Uh, of charities that have approached me uh, about Chris, where, saying could he work with, you know, ex-convicts? Could he work with people in similar situation who are trying to turn their life around? And and Chris is just the right sort of person to do that. He's also become quite well known because of this show. Probably better known than than most of us on the boat because he's certainly been the most talked about guy. And and you know he needs to use that to his advantage. What what did you learn about leadership on that boat? For my for my personal role, 
I learnt a lot about the art of followership, about playing, you know, a really solid number two. Followship rather than fellowship. Yeah, followship. Follow followership is is where, you know, you you provide you you, you may not be the leader, but you know what it takes to lead. And you know that it's a difficult place. And so you do everything you can to support the person who, who is in charge. And quite often we're in situations where the person who's in charge, we don't necessarily agree with everything they do. And if you're a good leader, you recognise, you surround yourself by people who can do the things you can't do uh, and and give them the space to get on with it. And that's really, you know, a confident leader will always do that. And I think in this particular role, you know, Ant was uh, confident to, to allow me to do the things that I could do. I also learnt that, uh, you know, leadership is, is very situational. At times you need people to be able to sort of step up. Uh, and so our doctor, for example, who, you know, was cast as a guy who was, you know, quite possibly going to quit within the first few weeks. And yet he became a real tower of strength in the most unlikely situation this is a guy who's never been on a boat before was terrified of being on a boat and yet by the end of it you know he he was someone who 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 had a, a real influence you know he i use this expression a lot influence without authority he was someone who could actually influence the outcome because people really trusted his judgment particularly his medical judgment um and he was very solid very solid and and um the boat. You loved it so much, you bought it. So <laughs> tell me why. It, it's a piece of furniture. It, it, when, I, when we arrived in Timor and we were sat you know, all together on, on the beach, you know, we walked up that beach, that pebbly beach, you know, guys burst into tears with the emotion of it all. And we were sat on there looking back out to sea. And I, I looked at that boat that was just sort of gently washing up the beach and thought, bloody hell, that thing's got us 4,000 miles. It's taken us, you know, through all manner of conditions. You know, it's the one thing that, you know, has kept us all safe and well. I've I've partnered up with uh, a local charity that's uh, based, headquartered in Exeter, but based in Plymouth. They operate three classic boats, and they run these residential programmes for, for young people, to who, who some of which, you know, have never made a cup of tea. You know, they've never um, they've never been in a group environment. These are the you know some of the some of the kids, poor communities who some of them don't go to school. Some of them are out of the educational system entirely, and yet when you put them together for a week on this boat, they start off. They're awkward. They're challenged. They can't talk to one another. They can't work together, and within a week of being on a boat, they're just transformed. And appropriately enough, you're calling it the Bounty Project. Um, we'll, we'll stick URL and contact details, Twitter accounts and so on. We'll, we'll put that on the, our Facebook page, but um, give us a bit more info. Yes, I mean, you know, the, the Bounty Project, very simply, you just, you know, just go to at the Bounty Project. Um, uh, you'll, you'll be taken either to the Island Trust site where there's a whole page about, uh, about the project or on Facebook, we're on Facebook now. With uh, it's probably the best best place, um, and uh, and through there you can you can make a donation to the project, uh, which you know the money raised will go towards you know these sort of bursary places to get these young people out sailing. Uh, you can book a visit, so you know the the the, the uh, boat itself could come to a school if you're a school teacher and you're wanting to to get involved with a project like this then uh, you can make a booking directly through uh, through these these websites okay now so here's the spoiler alert if you haven't seen the uh, the series and you want to watch it um i fast forward by about two minutes or a minute and a half on this podcast so you miss the spoiler um but basically it's not exactly a disney ending is it it ends in failure you do make it to where you're going, but not as you'd wanted to. So just talk us through those agonising last few hours and days. We effectively, we got becalmed uh, when we left the last island in northern northern tip of Cape York in Australia. We were, we were absolutely on the bones of our arse. We, uh, we were limited with water. We had about 10 days worth of water and it should have been a 10 day crossing. At the first three days, we made good progress in the trade winds, uh, and then we ran out of wind. 
and in fact we didn't just run out of wind. I don't think I have ever in my whole sailing career seen waters as calm as we had for 10 days. And that not... is saying something. You've been around the world three times. Yeah. This was this was this was not even a ripple. Um you know this was water so calm that actually when you looked at it you could see the entire weight loss in your reflection. We effectively had two two uh, two things going on and uh, wanted to sit tight you know he wanted to wait for the wind he wanted us to to survive by doing absolutely nothing and just to keep our energy which is not that not not wrong in a lot of survival circumstances um, my fear was that the wind was not going to come it, 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 we felt so entrenched in a high pressure system there's only really two things that can happen either it moves or you move and the only way we were going to move was to was to either row or to find some way of making progress out of it um and we ended up not agreeing about what to do you know sitting tight wasn't an option rowing we were too weak to row uh, uh and and i don't think i probably made the case strong enough in terms of why we should row but the inevitable happened that we would run out of water and we would need an intervention you know we'd need the support boat to come along and 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 give us water to to be able to continue but you weren't being pathetic you really were running you had run out of water but you, your bodies were risking having major issues yeah yeah i mean we were we were dehydrated um all the way along that 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 route I mean, we'd gone from you know probably comfortably two liters down to a liter <coughs> um to to half a liter of water and half a liter of water in 50 degree heat with everything that was going on was was dangerously low your risk of long-term injury kidney failure um you know heat exhaustion i mean we're talking about things that that that, that are life-threatening happening and from the outside looking in you know we luckily we did have a support boat looking out for us and they could see that we were in trouble uh we were in trouble um and uh and they intervened and gave us water it felt at the time like we'd you know we'd failed um had we been left to our own devices would have, would we have died at that moment quite possibly you know maybe bly it, with 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 the time of year that he left the the amount of rain he had the wind he had maybe he didn't really suffer from dehydration in the way that we did but we certainly in the timor sea we would have died had we not had an intervention finally um would you do it again have you got any other projects up your sleeve <clears throat> one thing it has really given me is is a love for just very stripped back um, you know, we've been watching the Vendée Globe, we've been watching the America's Cup, you know, these ultra competitive, you know, and I and I have a huge passion for, as you know, for that, that end of the sport. But this was something so different. It was completely stripped bare. It was it was basic hemp boat, hemp ropes, you know, wooden boat. It was, you know, traditional sails. It was it was it was living without any technology, uh, with simple navigation. And I actually really, really loved that challenge. And so, you know, I may well go and do something in a similar fashion. Well, right now, I think um, the challenge is in, in the bar at the Royal Geographical Society. There's a, a nice bottle of red wine there, so it's time to head back in. Uh, thanks very much, Conrad. It's been fascinating uh, listening to the adventure. And uh, yeah, well, we'll... we'll follow your next crazy adventure let's uh, let's go to that bar i'm very thirsty now <laughs> so obviously that dehydration is kicking in again just before we go though i've got to tell you uh, that we'll be coming from bermuda next month hard life i know but someone's got to do it uh, and by then the challenger series will be well underway uh, as a monthly podcast we've decided we're, we're just not intending to to bring you the latest results and race analysis uh, apart from that i'll be up to my ears doing just that um, for viewers around the world on the on the live tv coverage but 
we will bring you some amazing backstage stories and features and some really heartwarming stories as well from the America's Cup scene. But for now, from me, Alec Wilkinson, thanks for tuning in and happy sailing.